is shining in the midst of the darkness shining jesus light of the world shine upon us set us free by the truth you now bring us shine on me shine on me shine jesus shine Send forth your word, Lord, and let there be light. Good morning. Thanks for joining me. Um, I am reviewing the lesson for today, and I realize it's Father's Day. Happy Father's Day to me and to all the fathers and grandfathers in our audience. Um, I have a Father's Day lesson for you and it's not a long one but I want to finish up you know our, our discussion of Gideon and I think it really applies to being a good father as well but it's not my Father's Day lesson I just want to wrap up the Gideon lesson that we started last week and then I, I, I have some thoughts for fathers uh, a father's role and what he should be living up to when we're looking at Gideon um, I was mentioning to someone that sometimes I, I don't follow my lesson outline as closely as I should, and when I do, I start telling stories and story after story. Um, I remember when that happened to my dad. <laughs> it was about, when he was about my age, it seemed like, okay, Dad, we've heard that story several times now. And it, it just got to where he repeated a lot of stories. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to try to follow my lesson today. And... Uh, We'll see how that goes. So we've determined that Gideon doesn't feel like he's adequate enough to be a deliverer of the people of Israel. In fact, he's, he conceives himself as the smallest in his family, the, the weakest. He also sees himself as having to hide his, his work, his uh, beating out the, the wheat from the Midianites who were the enemies. He, he's, He's a scared. Uh, it's, it's interesting that God chose him. But see, God can make us what he wants us to be. And he saw Gideon as a deliverer, someone who could deliver the people of Israel, even if Gideon felt inadequate. So I'm in Judges chapter 6. Now, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy are the first five books. It's called the Torah. That's the first five books in the Old Testament. And then we have Joshua, which is the beginning of going into Canaan, the Palestine area, which is the promised land. And so Israel is moving into the promised land. And the book of Judges, right after Joshua, is about that 400-year period of disobedience, deliverance, disobedience. I mean, it, it was a dark period of Israel's history. And that last verse in the book of Judges is important. In those days, there was no king in Israel, so everyone did whatever he thought was right in his own eyes. That means there's no moral guide other than what you might have heard from mom. So it's interesting that that is the way they closed that book. It was a dark period. They weren't looking to God to be their king. They were looking elsewhere. So that brings us to the wrap up is God was very patient with Gideon. Uh, he just did not jump on board and say, yes, God, what do you want me to do? But rather he kept testing God. And that is an interesting how patient God was with him. I don't think we should test the patience of God. I really don't. I don't suggest you look for a sign or say, God, if, if you give me a sign, I'll do this. No, that's not the way God works. In Gideon's case, he decided to, you know, allow Gideon his little test. 
but I wouldn't recommend it to anybody else. And we're going to read in chapter 6 of Judges 19 through 24. 19 through 24. I'm still in Samuel, sorry. Judges 6. And in verse 19, it starts, So Gideon went into his house and prepared a young goat and unleavened cakes from an ephah of flour. The meat he put in a basket and the broth he put in a pot and brought them to him, the angel of the Lord, under the terebinth and presented them. And the angel of God said to him, Take the meat and the unleavened cakes and put them on this rock and pour the broth over them. And he did so. Then the angel of the Lord reached out the tip of the staff that was in his hand and touched the meat and unleavened cakes. And fire sprang up from the rock and consumed the meat and the unleavened cakes and the angel of the Lord vanished from his sight. That is a sign. You would think that's all Gideon would need. See, Gideon wanted to keep the angel of the Lord close by. I guess he maybe saw him as protection. So he offered a sacrifice. He brought him a meal. And the angel didn't eat the meal. He set it on fire and burned it up and then disappeared. That's all I need for a sign. Whatever that angel's message was, I'm ready to do what God wants me to do. But it wasn't enough for Gideon. In fact, he went on. Look at verses 36 through 40. Then Gideon said to God, If you will save Israel by my hand, as you have said, behold, I am laying a fleece of wool on the threshing floor. If there is dew on the fleece alone and it is dry on all the ground, then I shall know that you will save Israel by my hand, as you have said. He's testing God. And it was so. When he rose early the next morning and squeezed the fleece, he wrung enough dew from the fleece to fill a bowl with water. Then Gideon said to God, Let not your anger burn against me. Don't get mad at me. Let me speak just once more. Please let me test just once more with the fleece. Please let it be dry on the fleece only and all the ground around let there be dew. And God did so that night. And it was dry on the fleece only and on all the ground there was dew. I've all, since I was a little kid, I've always wondered, why did God put up with that? Why didn't God say, well, I'll just get somebody else? Because he already saw that Gideon would be the one. But Gideon had some baggage he had to let go of. And all of this baggage resulted in God giving him signs. And those signs allowed Gideon to step forward in faith and obey God. He started taking steps. In fact, that's the last thing I wanted to point to is in chapter 7, verses 14 and 15. Chapter 7, 14 and 15, it says, And his comrade answered, there is no, This is none other than the sword of Gideon and the son of Joash, a man of Israel. God has given into his hand Midian and all the camp. As soon as Gideon heard the telling of the dream and its interpretation, he worshipped. And he returned to the camp of Israel and said, Arise, for the Lord has given the host of Midian into your hand. So there was another sign there, but it wasn't necessarily because Gideon didn't believe God now. It was he was still scared. He was still feeling inadequate. So God said, If you're still scared, sneak down into the Midianite camp tonight. And so he did. He took his servant with him. They went down and they listened in the tent. And a man woke up from a dream and said, Oh, Gideon has, has become all powerful through God and he's going to destroy us. That's all Gideon needed to hear. Because God is the one who put the dream in the Midianite's ear or head so that he began to show that they were scared of Israel. They were scared of the God of Israel. And so then Gideon went back and says, Okay, let's go to war. We're going to get rid of Midian once and for all. But, interestingly, he said, How many men will go and fight with me? 
33,000 men came out to be soldiers to deliver Israel from their oppressors. God said, okay, it's just a little bit too many. So tell anyone that doesn't want to fight to just go home. So he said, well, anyone that doesn't want to be here, go home. 22,000 went home. <laughs> so now there's only 10,000 men against over 100,000. I think it was 300,000 Midianites. 10,000. So now we don't have enough. But God says, no, you still got too many. He says, take them all down to the stream and tell them to take a drink of water. And those that get down on all fours and put their mouth to the water and start drinking like a dog, tell them to go home. But those who get down on a knee and scoop the water to their mouth, tell them that to stay and they will fight for Israel. Only 300 scooped to their mouth. 300 men. And they're supposed to go against thousands and thousands of armed soldiers. Doesn't sound like God knows what he's doing. But Gideon has already taken steps in his faith and he's growing in his belief that God is going to empower them. So God tells him his plan, the plan works, and with 300 men, they chase the Midianites, Midianites right out of Israel. And they have been delivered through the hand of Gideon. Because of that, Israel had a time of peace. They worshiped God while Gideon was alive. And once Gideon had died, they began to slip back into their disobedience. And that's a story for another day. So I have a, a lesson that you can take with you, an ancient solution to modern problems that we have. The Lord chose you to serve in the body of Christ. You may not feel adequate to serve but the Lord empowered Gideon to serve him, and he can empower each one of us to serve him. Go to 1 Corinthians with me. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. It's in your New Testament. Way back in the New Testament. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And there's a key part of this verse that I just can't get out of my head as far as making this a, a modern solution to modern problem. Um, 17 and 18. 1 Corinthians 12, 17. Must be humid today. My pages are sticking together. Here it is. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? Makes sense. If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But as it is, God has arranged the members in the body. We're talking about the body of Christ, his people. He's arranged the members in the body, each of them as he chose. He chose Gideon to serve. And Gideon took baby steps and grew in his faithfulness and was able to deliver Israel from their oppression. So is it possible that God has a plan for our lives, each one of us. He sees us as mighty men of valor or great comforters who bring the gospel message to others. Is it possible God sees us and yet we feel inadequate? I suggest that we can learn from Gideon that if we'll take baby steps in faithfulness, we believe in God, so now take a step in your belief and let God work through you to make you what you want to be, what he wants you to be. So, I think that's a great message for fathers too, don't you? It's very possible that by looking at these stories, you'll realize that the father of all, the creator, God Almighty, his teaching on fatherhood is an imitation of the way he teaches teaches us the way he treats us. So could we do a better job? Well, I want to start with a poem on Father's Day. 
And this is a, a recommendation to all fathers, grandfathers, uncles, older brothers who are caring for younger siblings. If you are in a position to help someone in your family, as a father would, then listen carefully. Take a moment to listen today to what your children are trying to say. Listen today, whatever you do, or they won't be there to listen to you. Listen to their problems, listen to their needs, praise their smallest triumphs, praise their smallest deeds, tolerate their chatter, amplify their laughter. Find out what's the matter, find out what they're after. But tell them that you love them every single night and though you scold them, be sure you hold them. Tell them everything's all right. Tomorrow's looking bright. Take a moment to listen today to what your children are trying to say. Listen today, whatever you do, and they will come back and listen to you. The author is unknown, but I think that's a great lesson for us is as God listens to our prayers, Let's listen to the needs of our families and our children and respond with love and kindness and discipline. Be the father that God is to us, to our own families. So the message that I wanted to bring to you today begins with 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. And we'll do what we can on this. There's three simple points I want to share with fathers today as what their role in the family is. 1 Thessalonians, that's in your New Testament toward the back. And uh, if you have trouble finding it, look it up in the uh, directory at the front of the Bible. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, 1 and 2 Thessalonians. And we're looking at chapter 2 in 1 Thessalonians. I would like to begin in verse 6. Maybe I'll begin in verse 5. For we never came with words of flattery, as you know, nor with a pretext for greed. God is witness. A lot of times the apostles were accused of doing this for monetary gain. that They were going out to these churches and establishing churches and then taking money. He said, we didn't do this for gain or flattery, nor did we seek glory from people, whether from you or from others, though we could have made demands as apostles of Christ. But we were gentle among you, like a nursing mother taking care of her own children. So being affectionately desirous of you, we were ready to share with you not only the gospel of God, but also our own selves, because you have become very dear to us. We see here pictures of the affection that a mother shows to the daughter or the baby, a nursing mother shows affection to her baby, and a father shows affection to his family. Well, that's part of the father's role. And the Apostle Paul knew that we all knew what a father should be doing. So he, he compared the Apostle's work to that of a father caring for his children. Now, I've got to be honest with you, it's kind of deteriorated in our modern world. The family is not what it used to be. He could actually use an example like this, and everybody, it was common knowledge that fathers care for their children. Not all of them, but the majority would have. Well, I think it's swinging the other way in our world. So why not look at what God has shared with us here? and actually begin to care about our children. Listen to what they have to say. Give them insight. They, don't, they haven't lived and experienced what you have. So as a father, care about your children enough to have some give and take. Talk about things. It's important because you need them to listen to you because you have experience. And if we just let them go off on their own, guess what? There's not much hope for them that they'll ever come back and ask you your opinion. Or what should I do, Dad? Now, when I was uh, 
young, in my 20s and 30s, anytime I got in a fix, I didn't know what to do. You know who the first person I thought of was? My dad. Because, and he had to work hard at this, I'm sure. Whatever my problem was, it was usually of my own making. A bad decision here, a bad decision there, and all of a sudden, I, I don't know what to do. How can I straighten this out? And my dad would stop short of saying, well, you stupid kid. No, he didn't say that. He said, well, tell me what's going on. And I already knew that I was a stupid kid. So why did he have, he wouldn't want to put that in my face, but rather he'd listen. Then he'd say, well, well, let's look at some alternatives. You know, what about doing it this way next time? What about taking this path? But you know, the key wasn't necessarily his solution, but the fact that he listened and let me air it. Let me tell him what my problems were. And as a result, I could see solutions just by sharing it with my dad. So that poem is real good. And I think we need to realize that the apostles felt that way about the early church, like a dad. And we need to have that responsibility in our families. Sit down and just say, well, tell me about it. And stop short of using any derogatory terms like dumb, stupid. No, you don't need to do that. You just need to listen. And in the process, they're going to learn. So the first thing I wanted to point out, there's, there's three things I think fathers should be providing. And one is security. Now you might say, well, like an alarm on the door or the doorbell cam. No, that's not the kind of security I'm talking about. I'm talking about the kind of security that God offers to us. And if you haven't experienced that kind of security, well, get involved with the church. Get involved with other believers to learn from them what God has taught us about fathers. But if you do know what is right, and you're watching this and you're saying, okay, so how can I provide security for my family? Well, one way is to let them know that you'll never leave. Ooh, that's, that, that's not going to work out so well when half of our marriages end in divorce. And many of our couples and children aren't even married. So where's the security that you will never leave them if all they think about, well, Billy's dad left. He doesn't live at home anymore. Joe's mom left. She doesn't live at home anymore. And a lot of times those kids see it as, well, it must be me that's caused this problem. So. Jesus said to us in Hebrews, well, it's quoted in Hebrews 13, 5, never will I leave you nor forsake you. Do your children feel that way as a father in your family? I think that's so important. It's important because they need to have the security in knowing that you're going to be there for them no matter what. That gives them the sense of confidence that they've always got somebody watching them. Somebody's got their back. Dad, Dad's always there. I can go talk to Dad. So a father's role is providing security for his family. Um, Ephesians 5.25, which is back a few pages from the Thessalonians that we just did. And it's only a few pages. It goes uh, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. But in Ephesians 5, verse 25, it says, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Well, that's, that's important. A wise teacher once told me, if you want to provide security for your children, love their mother and never leave that will provide security. The, the second lesson I would like to leave with you is teaching, teaching your children. You have a responsibility as a father to make sure they are taught what is right, what is good, and a lot of that comes right from the Bible. So you can say, well, they can just 
go to school wherever, it doesn't matter. Well, most places aren't teaching them the godly truths that are in the Bible. So maybe you need to take more responsibility in their teaching. Um, in Ephesians chapter 6, the same book we're in, look at verse 4. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up. Bring them up. That's, the fathers have to be involved in that bringing up the children. In the discipline and instruction of the Lord. I do believe that this is the most important instruction our children should receive. Oh, they need to learn how to use a computer, or they need to learn how to read, they need to do this, they need to do that. Yeah, that's fine, and they should receive that instruction. But do not leave out the spiritual guidance that the God who created us gave us. And then finally, you are responsible for love in your family. Don't leave that up to mom only. It's very possible that you work hard all day, you come home a little grumpy, you just want to be left alone, you get your paper and you read your paper. Um, that's not expressing love. Show how much you love by asking questions, getting involved, going outside with the boys, or taking the girls on a hike. It's really important that you show your love. You know how I said belief? If that's all you have, you haven't moved into faithfulness. But when you act on your belief, that becomes faithfulness. When you want to be a dad, biologically, just about anybody, and I say that there's some that can't become parents. But if you are a dad biologically, but there's no love, it means nothing. Love is what keeps us going and doing the right thing. So happy Father's Day, everyone. I hope these have been helpful. Before you go, I want to offer our Bible course. It's a seven booklet Bible course. I send out, well, Alex sends them out now, but he'll send out lesson one. When you complete it, send it back, and then he'll send you the next lesson in the series. If you don't have a Bible to study with, we offer free of charge a hardcover English Standard Version Bible, same one that we read on the program. And all of these are available free of charge. If you would like the Bible or the course or both, you can write to Alex at the Marquette Church of Christ, P.O. Box 372-49855. Or you can go on our webpage and send a message through the webpage and we'll get back to you right away. Uh, we're also on YouTube and Podbean or Spotify, anywhere you watch your, listen to your podcast, go to Let the Bible Speak UP on either YouTube or Podbean. Thanks for being with me today. May God bless you this week.